Hi, Kara. Hi. Um, you got to let me editorialize for a minute. Please. Um, at a very unusual moment of time, mm -hmm. you are an extraordinarily important person. Oh, and I want to sing your praises to this group. If you don't listen to Kara's podcast on Recode, if you don't follow her journalism, if you don't watch her interview with Tim Cook, head of Apple tonight on MSNBC, 8 o'clock, yes. um, you're making a mistake because I'd argue, uh, I think fairly convincingly, this is one of the most important journalists in America. Uh, at Thank you. And, and I really feel passionate about All this right, for a okay. couple of reasons. Um, one is, at a time when I think many people are deeply appreciative of the importance of real journalism in America, right. um, your work is very important. Thank you. And at a time when you're arguably covering the most important beat in the world, right. more important than the White House, more important than Putin, but what's going on in oh, Silicon Putin's Valley? Putin's kind of important, but okay. <laughs> um, your work is crucial. <coughs> and particularly for those of you who don't know Kara, uh, your independence, your toughness, your profanity, mm, your willingness yes. to call a whatever a whatever. A fuck a fuck. A okay. fuck a fuck. Uh, and your remarkable, and this is from a journalist, the envious ability you have to get anybody to agree to talk to you. Yes. All adds up to, you really are, you. I think, a national resource. Oh, thank you. Well, gosh. So on that, I'm, gonna I'm go done. All right. We're gone. <laughs> So, um, you know, when I invited you to come and talk, it was because it was all about Me Too, and I think, yeah. I think we came up with a title sure. for this conversation about uh, what, why a woman should be running your right. company. That is and then true, since then the That remains true. And we're going to come back to that, but since then all the Facebook stuff has come back. Sure, so I'll be happy and to talk about that. You've been calling them on this for... About two years. About two years. Yeah. Um, what did you see that the rest of us didn't? Um, you know, I think... You know, for a long time, they like to sing their praises. They, they, that's their favorite thing. They're so smart. They're changing the world. And I would make fun of that. Like, that's kind of ridiculous. Um, and, you know, when you look at the lack of diversity, the lack of viewpoint, the la lack of life experience, it's very clear um, that there's going to be a problem, especially as these be people become wealthier and wealthier and control more slashes of the economy and, and really have a profound effect on news and information, essentially. And so I've been having, I have had a big issue with it, but when I started to see the statistic come out of Facebook where 60% of America gets its information from this company, uh, th I'm just using them, because Twitter's a whole, you know, a whole goat rodeo that's a different problem. Um, and they have, they're also culpable in not controlling their platform, but it's a different situation with them. Um, that this was a group of people that had enormous power and kept pretending to me when I talked to them that they didn't have power, that they shouldn't make decisions, that they didn't have the responsibility. And it started to really bother me. You know, I have two young uh, boys, and it's, it's literally like talking to them about cleaning their room. Like, oh, it's not my job. Like, you know what I mean? That kind of thing. And so, and, and by the way, my children are more mature than a lot of the people who work at these places. And so they, it just was sort of, it kept striking me. Like, I would have these meetings with top executives there, and they'd be like, you know, it's not really our responsibility to deal with this on the platform or this. And I'm like, what about this? And at one point, I know it sounds crazy, but there was um, two times, two moments with Facebook at least, was I went to see Facebook Live, uh, which was their video platform. Um, and there was a, um, a someone there, I'm not gonna say who was in the room, but it was important people at Facebook. And I looked at the thing and I said, um, what are you gonna do about people who kill someone, who murder someone on this platform? What about people who commit suicide? What about people who bully? And the response from the Facebook people was, Carrie, you're so negative. And I was like, what, have you not met the human race over the past, you know, whatever, some years they've been on this planet? It's kind of brutal. Like, and people, when people get these tools in their hands, and they were so, they're so interested in the possibilities of it, and I admire that optimistic personality trait, but they, did ha they just didn't occur to them that there are bad people in the world. And so I thought that was willfully ignorant. Like, willf like you have to try really hard not to imagine the abuses that could go on with Facebook Live. And then the second time it happened when um, 
when they, just anything they rolled out, it was like that. There was, I'm, I'm blanking on the second time it happened, but there were several experiences like that where I was like, are you not paying attention? I know what it was. It was when they all went to Trump Tower. They all trooped up there. And I'll just give you a breakdown of how I work. So they were going, there was this rumor that all the tech executives were going to, organized by Peter Thiel, um, were going to meet, um, who's his own piece of work. Um, and, uh, and everyone's like so polite. I'm like, he's awful. Like, you know what I mean? Like, he's an awful human being. And like, everyone's like, Carol, you have to be fair. I'm like, fairly speaking, he's an awful human being. Um, so, so he was organizing it, but no reporter had written about it, right? So I was literally at this market in San Francisco, this farmer's market, and I'm like, I'm gonna find out who's going. So I did, I just got on the phone and I started calling and I immediately figured it out. And I typed it out on my, on my iPhone and posted the story, which I, was why I love my job, because I can just do that. Um, and so I wrote a story of who was going to this thing, but what was really striking is they all wouldn't say they were going, they wouldn't talk on the record of that. They're going to meet the President of the United States or the President-elect. They all were like, don't, don't say I told you. I'm like, what? Like, you're going to meet, you're going to Trump Tower, they're gonna see you. It's kind of a prominent place. And so they go in and they don't say anything publicly about it, including um, immigration. This immig and Trump on the, on the campaign trail had been so incredibly awful about Muslims and I was like, wow, a lot of you are, you know, from those countries. A lot of the people who work in Silicon, they, if, you, if only in your self-interest, besides everybody else, this, is a, this rhetoric is really dangerous. And so I started texting with, I have a lot of their cell phones. Unfortunately, they gave them to me in better times. And I was like, are, he's going to say something against the Muslims. You know that. Like, he's going to do a Muslim ban. And, and they're like, no, he's not. We're going to talk to him. Like, this how powerful people talk. We're going to talk behind the scenes, and we'll take care of it for mm -hmm. you. I was like, I'd really rather you not. I'd rather you publicly say something. Right. So they didn't say anything. And I kept text several of them. I'm like, when he does the Muslim ban, you're going to write me an apology letter because I warned you several times it's going to happen. But I just got mad. So I write the news story. And then I read a column that Monday. I wrote the news story on a Saturday. I wrote the column on a Monday that said, this is a group of sheeple. Like, I call them sheeple. And so they didn't like that. They didn't like sheeple. Like, too bad. Like, that's the worst thing someone could say about you. So, so I said they were sheeple, that they didn't, say, they didn't say anything together as a group about immigration. I, that's the one thing. They, they can't agree on how, whether to have lunch or not, but they could agree about immigration, which is critical to the thriving of Silicon Valley, even in their best interest. And so I was sort of furious that they didn't say anything about immigration. And you know, what was interesting is right after the meeting happened, I, it was interesting, it was sort of a weird Stockholm syndrome with me as I insulted them terribly in this piece. And it was a fairly, but it was not unfair insult. You, go, you should go read this column because it was pretty tough, mm -hmm. but it wasn't unfair. I was saying, how could you skulk up to Trump Tower, not say you were going, make it a secret that you were going, and then not say anything when you leave. They, like, they ran out the back. I don't know if you saw that. They were like, mm -hmm. there's a back entrance to Trump Tower. They found it, you know. Um, and except for the Safra Katz from Oracle, who loves to be there, you know what I mean? So cause she's close with Trump. And so, so anyway, so they, and at least she like says she is, like, you know what I mean? Like, I'm, I'm not on her side on that, but in any case, so I write this column and then, I, so then they immediately, the minute they leave, they all, all their people, or whoever their, the sources said, call me and tell me what they said. Like, we did say, we talked to him about immigration. I'm like, you're an idiot. He's not going to listen to you. You're not Jesus. And you're not going to, like, convince this incredibly, uh, like, what he's, he's 86 times on the campaign trail. He talked about Muslims, mm -hmm. it, you know, about banning Muslims. He said it, he said it, he said it. And I said, I always feel like when someone, sh like, it's the Maya Angelou quote, when someone shows you who they are the first time, that's who they are. And so I believe Donald Trump when he says, th not, not when he says things, but you know what I mean, when he says the, the Muslim on ban. This issue. So, um, so he, so I, they were like, well, we told them real in the strongest of possible terms that we would not tolerate them. I'm like, oh, good, that'll work. Are you kidding? He's like a seven-year-old man. And he, and then he, they, then they did it. I said, when, when on, when he does this, I would like a text saying, you are a genius, Kara Swisher. And only one of them sent it. <laughs> it was kind of you, yeah. you have been for years. I sound like a scold now. Maybe the only, or at least one of the earliest people, to say that this notion that Silicon Valley is filled with these progressive yes. souls is just not true. It's not true. They're not. I would say selfish people. Yes, I would say 
libertarians, which is a lazy way of not wanting to take responsibility for any of your beliefs or values. You know what I mean? Right. Like, I, I, you know, I'm a gay person, so I don't. I, I once had an argument with Peter Thiel. It was astonishing. He's like, you know, you shouldn't get special rights. I'm like, I, I don't want special rights, but I don't want them to take my kids away because they don't take away straight people's kids. Like, that's called equal rights under the law. It's called the 14th Amendment. You might want to familiarize yourself with it. And so it, it's sort of this idea that that you're getting special rights. And I, I agree on lots of issues like identity politics has gone too far and stuff like that. But you really, you know, they really are not liberal. Some the, the workers are, but it's not a question of liberal. It's a question of what's what they can do for themselves right. versus right. what they can do for more people. So l l let me come back to Facebook and, yeah. and, and ask you this. Um, and, you know, Senator Wyden was here mm -hmm. and there's, you know, Zuckerberg has said, look, this was a mistake. We gave yeah. this rogue actor information. Mm -hmm. Is that really, isn't it fact true that this is central to the Facebook business model? Well, <laughs> which is to be able to gather and provide yes. data to create this brutal efficiency with their advertising. Sure. And that that's not something that they're going to give up simply because Well, they certainly widen. could have better control of it. I mean, the Russians, I mean, honestly, it's just insane that they let the Russians take over this platform and didn't notice it. Like, literally. You know, at one point last year when it started, I was like, this Russia thing's going to be a real problem for you. I talked to one of the executives. We know, and I said, stop saying numbers because you're only going to triple and quadruple them, and then I'm going to call you an idiot. Like, I don't really want to call you an idiot, but um, I think they they did not have control of their platform, and now they're doing the mistakes were made thing. Now, now look, let me just say, Mark Zuckerberg is a lovely person. I have all the many people I cover. He tries hard. He's super earnest. He's unfailingly polite. He's he's not one of the, what you would say, the bad guys. Oh, so, um, I will be asking you later yeah. for that list. <laughs> No, I, no, no, there's a lot, <laughs> most of them. Um, but he's really a lovely person. So I think he's trying really hard. He's quite earnest about it. And so are the Facebook executives. They are, a lot of them. Um, they're much, they're like, they're like, we feel bad. I was like, that you ruined democracy? Okay. Like, uh, you know, like, I mean, I joke, ha ha, Kara. I'm like, no, I'm not kidding. Like, you ruined democracy. Um, I just don't think they had a sense of, their responsibility and their power and their wealth. And that's sort of a Silicon Valley thing but where they, you know, they dress in t-shirts. You know, I'm a simple person. I'm like, with a private plane? Sorry. Once you get to the private plane, you're not a simple person. <laughs> like, but how is, how, are, how is Facebook and others going to react if they're told Congress wants to require that you ask me to opt in before you can share my data? I don't know if Congress is capable. I, look, let me just tell you, the people I hold in even lower regard are the politicians who need to legislate these. You know, they don't know what they're doing, you know, and they're so po politicized. I mean, that they can't pass DACA. Like, I, I literally, I, it's, it's astonishing. It's appalling. That they, and that's what Tim Cook said in this interview. It's actually appalling they cannot come to agreement on DACA. It's ridiculous. Um, these are people who've been in this country, no, I, I don't, it's no fault of their own thing. They are wonderful people who deserve to be here, and it's exactly what's at the heart of our country, is people coming here with innovative spirits that want to make good. And the demonizing of immigrants is so demented at this point that we even put up with it is astonishing. But getting back to Facebook, what, were you, what was your question? Well, the point is... Yeah. Uh, uh, there, I don't think Congress if, is if, capable but of... It, let's doing say, it. so hypothetically, Congress yeah. passes... I mean, is Facebook... I mean, doesn't that destroy their business model? No, it doesn't destroy it. It doesn't destroy How many of us are going to opt in? Well, I think a lot of people will. I think a lot of people is, but I think it's the question of putting it in plain English, how it works, what they're doing with their information, and having more control over the political stuff. To start with, the political stuff has to be controlled, and so you can't have these abuses. Like, last year, I've told this story before, and I actually told it on stage. I interviewed Hillary Clinton last year, and she was all hopping mad about the Russia stuff. And, of course, everyone was like, oh, she's just being... Like, Hillary's just mad she lost. She was 100% right about everything she said. Like, as it's turned out, right. you know, she's correct. Um, and uh, so she was mad about, like, the emails and everything else. And there was one thing that used to drive me. I told her this story on stage. There was a story on Facebook that was um, that she was a lizard. She was a lizard person from another planet, which was interesting. Um, and if you just scratched her skin, you could see the lizard skin underneath. It was insane. But it was all over Facebook. Like, it was, a, like, it was like the Denver Daily or some fake news organization, yeah. some real fake news organization. Yeah, yeah. I hate to use that word because it's been so badly mangled by President Trump. Um, but, um, but he, and I kept calling Facebook people and saying, she's not a lizard. Can you take this down? Like, what is your problem with the lizard? Like, it drove me crazy. But it was a, it was a responsibility for the system. They could certainly start to be more responsible about 
who's on the who who's who's available on it. Like Snapchat curates, Apple curates, they can curate, and they just don't want to curate. All right, That's so let's really let's talk about Apple. You yeah. did an interview earlier this week, last, last week, week with Tim Cook, Cook, which is going to air Chicago, tonight. Yeah. Um, you've leaked some of that out, but yeah. you've got Tim Cook, who, at least in public, is a pretty discreet individual he is. He is. to basically body slam yes, Facebook. Yes, he did. He did a good so one. Tell yeah. the audience what you so got him to say. Before you focus on that, this was a, this was a, Apple had an education event at Lane Tech High School in Chicago. They, they were talking about coding and where jobs are going, and that's where I'm interested in. That's because, that's like, that's the real stuff. Like, you know, that's, that's real, wh how people are going to work. And so we did an interview that was about education, about coding, about immigration, um, about all kinds of things, but this quote got, so I also said I, I need to ask you about the news of the day, Tim, and so we were talking about privacy issues, and we, I interviewed Steve Jobs many years ago with Walt Mossberg, and we got him to say, it's been all over the internet, his privacy quote, you should see it, we put it up on Recode. Um, he had quite a lot to say about privacy, and Apple, you know, they've got issues in China, they've got privacy issues several places, but the fact of the matter is they've been the most out front compared to most tech companies. You always find issues, but in general, they're quite strong. Obviously, Tim went against the Obama administration on encryption, mm -hmm. which was tough. That mm -hmm. was a tough thing because the FBI was after him. All kinds. Right. Uh, James Comey actually uh, was was sort of attacking Apple um, a couple years ago around the San Bernardino shooting. Um, and so, what was interesting was um, was that he he did that. He so I asked him about about Mark, and he started to you know it's in Apple's interest to say we believe in privacy because their business model is based on selling you an iPhone, not about privacy. They don't have an advertising, they could have an advertising business. And he made that point, if we wanted to abuse all these profiles, we could, but we, that's not our business. Our business is getting you to buy AirPods and iPhones, and that's it, pretty much. Um, and in some other stuff, but most of the money is made from sales of devices. Oh, right. yeah. um, and so he then said, I said, well, what would you do? And he, he it's a, there's a lot more than that, just that quote, where he, so he said, I said, what would you do if you were Mark Zuckerberg? And he said, I wouldn't be in that situation, which was really mean, <laughs> super mean for Tim. Very nasty. Not nasty. It was not nasty. Everyone's like cat fight in Silicon Valley. I think he was making a point. Is that I really appreciate it because, you know, some people are like, oh, well, he was on his high horse. I'm like, so what? He, what he said was correct. Like, um, you know, he, there should be an, it's not adult supervision. You know, Mark's an adult. He has two children. Um, it's it's that y you have to start taking responsibility for your creations. And that's, I think, I I'm glad Tim said it, and I'm glad he said it out of his mouth as a leader of Silicon Valley, because everybody else in Silicon Valley, when something goes wrong, nobody will say anything. Like, oh no, you know. So, so I appreciate it. So uh, let me shift a little bit and talk about um, the sort of AI debate yeah. and sort of the Elon Musk versus Zuckerberg. Where, where do you not fall? Zuckerberg, it's Google really right. more than... Where yeah. do you fall on that divide between Musk who thinks well, it's you know something to be truly frightened of right. and Google whose attitude Elon's, is... Elon's pretty dramatic, isn't he? Um, so uh, we did, they, we actually he started talking about an interview we did with him two years ago yeah. on stage um, and he started talking about um, the fact that, that AI will render us humanity house cats I don't think he thinks it's d as dangerous as it is, is that it will just supersede us, you know, in the, um, in the evolutionary phase, essentially. And so I think his issue was that you had to get uh, something jacked into your brain to compete with the AI and things like that. Um, and then he went off in a direction saying we're all, it's, not, it's all a, a simulation. So what's the, and then I'm like, so what's the difference about AI if right. this is all a game from some future group of people that are playing a game, which is a terrible game, it's so boring, my life. And so, <laughs> um, so they, um, so anyway, so he's, his, he's of the thing, and Stephen Hawking was also, that these, these technologies are gonna get ahead of us, and they're gonna, they're gonna supersede us. I think, it's not that they're benign, they don't care. I think that's, I think he thinks there's some evil dictator that's gonna, it's gonna be like the Terminator movie. I suspect it's gonna be a lot different than that, where it's, just doesn't care about us, like we, like a house cat. I think that was the correct way to think about it. Um, and then on the side with Google, and we actually the same year had Sundar Pichai and uh, Cheryl and the CTO of Facebook there that year. And they're they're like doing the story of it's a happy, shiny future. Like everything will be easy, every selection will be. You don't need to do things. And you know, I think it's probably in the middle. There's some like astonishing things that AI and automation and robotics and self-driving are going to make great 
Like, there's no reason. I mean, it's interesting because Trump talks about coal miners. Humans should probably not be coal mining if machines can do it better. I hate to say that because my family's from a coal mining family, but it's dangerous. In Sweden, they're doing all this mining by machines. I machine. thought you were from Long Island. No, a lot well, of coal in I've Long been a lot of places. Oh, but, all right. Um, but my uh, part of my family is in coal mining in Pennsylvania and West Virginia, and. Um, so it's, it's a really interesting question, but I think one of the things that's not happening is everybody's in this divisive area arguing about this crap rather than thinking about, okay, look, this is going to happen. We're going to have mining being done by robots. We're going to have automation. We're going to have self-driving. We're going to have AI. There's no smart regulators, industry, and citizenry, by the way. It's not the citizens who sit around and just complain and bellyache, which is what they seem to be doing now, although more and more people are becoming activists. They're responsible for their future, so they should demand of their regulators and legislators and companies the kind of things that you want to have happen and have a cogent debate which is what we're trying to do with this MSNBC right. special because I you know I'm on I'm on I have a deal with uh, NBC but you know some of the stuff on cable and not just NBC is just like six people yelling at each other and there's no illumination and I hate I won't do it I won't go on with one of those idiot panels right. um, but it, you know I wanted to get some illumination on big issues like automation AI and stuff like that so uh, you know I think if if done correctly it could be an astonishing it could, all these so things. Really, have and, and, and actually, if people have questions, we've got a few minutes late. Come to the microphone, and um, the future of work. Yeah, that's my uh, big topic. Yeah, how, how, how rapidly is this going to? Well, happen? you know, you, you can either go into the the sort of like the reason I got inspired by it is I've been having an ongoing argument with Mark Andreessen for 20 years now about everything. Um, and he's, uh, he's just very argumentative, um, so am I. And one of the things he said on stage last year at our code conference was, Kara, it's, I was talking about jobs, because I'm very, you know, jobs was what the election hinged on, really, away from all the, the racism and everything else, but it, jobs was really at the heart of it, mm -hmm. and people's worry about society. And so I always see it like there's a top group of people at society uh, who've made, some of, at the very top have gotten obscenely wealthy, um, and so, but who like the future, they're, they're pushing into it, they like it, it's good for them, they're learning about it. There's a group at the bottom which are, which are permanently stuck, it feels like it. They're, they're, they're not educated properly to, for the coming, what's happening. They, there's a lot of opiate addiction, everywhere there's opiate addiction, but you know, there's a lot of like hopelessness and it's, it's not a black or white thing or a racial thing, it's just there's a bottom group of people that are not prepared for what's coming. Nor, and we've let them down enormously in education especially. And then there's a group in the middle who know the future could be good, but, but they understand the future could kill them at the same time. And so those are the people that I wanted to reach, like I wanted to talk about their jobs. So, so with AI, you could imagine, um, what do we need lawyers for? A lot of stuff could be digit. A lot of legal stuff is easily digitizable. Doctor, a number of doctors, radiologists particularly. You don't need radiologists. You need one, not ten. Like, um, you know, and the, the car thing is easy. You don't need drivers. You, but by the way, you don't need parking garages. You don't need mechanics. You don't need insurance companies. Nobody has a car. What happens to that business? Everything iterate. Malls. Why do you need malls? And so what Mark said on stage was, Kara is just like the farming to manufacturing shift. You know. It was a little bumpy, but you know, we ended up, it was better. There were more jobs, there were better things. And I was like, a little bumpy, Mr. Not lack of any historical knowledge whatsoever kind of thing. And so if you look back to that era, there was a huge amount of social unrest. There was a huge amount of difficulties and problems, and it took 70 years. This is a compressed time period of 30, maybe 20, 30 years. In this environment with the populist uh, anger growing, it's really problematic, like you start to see the social implications. And you don't need Russia to make it worse. It's a, it's a difficult situation, although they're doing an excellent job. And the only thing they do well is just bad things. It's <laughs> astonishing. <laughs> if you ever visit that country, it's, it's like a permanent mess. Like everything, nothing works there. But it's, um, it's a shame. Uh, but it's, uh, it's a real problem coming up. And it's not just low, it's not coal miners. It's, ev it's everybody. Any job that can be digitized will be digitized. And, maybe should be digitized, but it will be. Like, it doesn't really matter. You can debate whether it should be. It's going to be. It's an so encouraging that's, thought. That's, All right. Well, it's, it's we have a question here. Hi. <coughs> Thank you. 
Um, <clears throat> so on the topic of regulation of Facebook and other platforms, we just had the SESTA regulation pass as part of the big spending bill. Mm -hmm. And um, the concern, there's a concern that bots will be used to enforce the SESTA that will actually hide the voices of vulnerable populations. And I wondered if you could talk about what we should be looking for in terms of the best case scenario, the worst case scenario. I, I don't know about this, so I, I can't talk Neither about Neither do I. I don't oh, know about the, it. The Cloud Act and the SESTA Act were okay. just passed as part of the big spending bill. Okay, and, and what are you asking specifically? How do so, we? So that it enforces regulation of these platforms. And, um, and there's a concern that now that these tech companies are forced to regulate their content, will um, they be compelled to use bots to do this work because they obviously you know, don't have the personnel. I see what you're saying. They, they aren't very regulated. Okay. By the way, the tech industry is the least regulated group of people on the planet. Just ask any other regulated body. And they and that's, you know, that's a problem that they have, don't have any, there's hardly any regulation. But in this case, um, th what they're doing, like a lot of the stuff they're doing is say YouTube. I just interviewed Susan Wojcicki, who's the CEO of YouTube. Um, and one of the issues um, is around what do they, they get, tens of millions of hours of video there, like t tons and tons and tons. And so how do you do that? So they, her thing, she was hiring 10,000 people, I think, and Facebook is committed to hiring 20,000 people. I think Cheryl said 20,000 people. It's not enough people to, to monitor this because they can't monitor this much volume of information. And so they have to use algorithmic, it's not bots, it's algorithmic solutions. And so the question is, who's putting the stuff into the algorithm? Who's making the algorithm? How do they employ the algorithm? But there's no way they're going to be able to do this stuff without help of technology. There's 100% no way. There's not enough people. There's not, you can't, 10 million people can't monitor this stuff. And by the way, they have their inherent biases and everything else. And so it's, I think they have to use technology to, to begin to manage this problem. What they haven't done is they've allowed the tools that they have provided to people to abuse them. Um, and then said, I can't believe people have used them, I think. We have a question here. So um, I find your perspective very refreshing. Thank you. <laughs> and, they don't. Um, yes, as, they do. As somebody who often brings up issues in meetings and things like that, I get accused of being a negative Nancy a lot yeah. when I'm trying to be Rhonda realist. Oh, okay, and Rhonda. So, <laughs> yeah, I'm try so what, what do you suggest for people out there, especially women and people of color who have that extra bias against them, yeah. trying to bring up these issues? in the actual, when they're being creative, what do you Yeah, you know, I, I don't know how to put this to you, but you just can't give a fuck. I don't know how to do it. It's like, you just can't, you just can't. It's not, you, you know, if you wanna be the most liked, you can't do it, like, right? You know what I mean? And so I think it's, it, one of the things, I was at a thing, um, they were talking about women being angry, you know, because of Me Too and things like that. I don't think we're angry enough. I don't think we're angry enough, you know, and there's nothing wrong with anger, right? Like, like if you were, uh, you know, why th these videos that are coming out of Sacramento, not just young black men shouldn't be angry, we should all be furious that this is happening. And so what they try to do, really interesting, because I'm raising two sons and poor guys, um, they're like, even they, they're like, okay, this women's thing, okay, that's enough, we get it. It's not enough. It's like, you know what I mean? Like, it's not like, it's not centuries of, ab of abuse and problem, because not all men are, most men are great. Many men are great. Men, I'll say many, not most. Um, but they're, you know what I mean, you know, in any case. What, what I find fascinating in the Me Too thing, all right, who broke those stories? Do you know who broke those stories, those big stories on Harvey Weinstein? Joey Cantor. Women and a gay man. Guess why? They understood, they understood. They saw, they could see. And I don't think it, it means that it's, it, it, it takes, abrogates responsibility for everybody not to see, but I think there's no, there, it, it is an absolute link between who they are and what they broke. Like, it's, they, could, they could see it, they, could, they know it, they've experienced it. Ronan Farrow is a gay man, understands discrimination. They, he understands these little, these things that go on. And what was fascinating around the Me Too stuff to me, and, and we co covered Ellen Powell, Nellie did a great job for us covering Ellen Powell actually, astonishing job, um, was that every woman we talked to when we were covering that, and that's today through this Harvey Weinstein and everything else stuff, um, every single woman had a story, or 10, probably 10 stories at least, ranging from very small microaggressions to very serious abuse. Many people were down here 
fewer people were here, but there were enough that it was disturbing. Um, every single woman had a story, and lots of them, lots of lots and lots and lots and lots of them. A lot of men who were really wonderful men were like, Kara, I, I was so surprised. I didn't know. So I was, you know that, but like, but like the thing is, are, are women not telling them? Where is the, where's the disconnect of the stories not being told? And so I found that I think the only way that you get change in this world is you make noise and you continue to make noise. As a gay person of a certain age, listen, I couldn't have kids many years ago. You couldn't have, you know what I mean? Like you didn't have marriage. Just think of that change. The, the change happened with, I believe, with besides AIDS, which was tragic way for, that, to the, for the focus to, do, to, to put on gay lives, was uh, through noise, act up. You know, silence equals death. We're pissed, you know, me, like all kinds of things. Like, I'll tell a very brief story when my, my mom, I tell this story, she drives her crazy, but she did it. Um, I asked, she, she lives in, she has a Pennsylvania residence, and so when Rick Santorum was running for senator, he was very anti-gay and gay ado anti-gay adoption. And I had, my partner, my ex and I had, had kids, and then we cross-adopted. And so at the time when, we, when they were young, we had to put a ton of effort into, um, the, the, the paperwork was insane. I felt like, why do I have to pay this much money and straight people have to pay nothing? But that's another you know, issue. So we had to do a ton of stuff, and, but he was anti-adoption completely across the board. And so I said to my mom, this is her grandchildren, I said, you, they were young, and I said, you, you can't vote for him. You, you may not vote for him. Like, if you do, there'll be, con just don't vote, because this guy is against your grandchildren. And we had an argument about it. She was not the nicest when I came out, but she evolved, like a, every gay person has that story. Um, and so she, so she, she, okay, I'm like, no, really, it's really important to me. If you vote for him, you're saying something, because this is his main thing. Like, it's not a little thing, it's his main thing. And so I said, I can't make you not do it, but I can tell you there'll be consequences if you do. You cannot see your grandchildren if you, or for a while, I'll have a, like, I, I have a control over them, and you cannot do that. I'm sorry, this is a big issue for us, because we were in the middle of the adoption. And I know I sound like scolding, too bad. Like, it's my rules. Like, it's my kids, it's my rules, essentially. And I don't want people around them that do things to their, and I love my mother, so. So anyway, so she, so we're at Thanksgiving dinner right after the election, and he lost, I think he lost, I'm pretty sure he lost, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, he lost the election. And, um, and now he's on cable, plaguing us still. Mm -hmm. um, attacking Parkland teens, like what a fucking douchebag to do that, like, right? Um, so, like, leave them alone, like, so what? Um, so, they can't resist that right wing, they just can't resist those kids, so. It's like the, it's like the Scooby-Doo kids, right? <laughs> like those kids, uh, they, they figured, they foiled us again. Um, so, to get back to my story. So we're at Thanksgiving dinner and my mom says, um, we were talking and we were talking about Rick Santorum and she said, I voted for him. And I said, what? Like, what? Say what? And she's like, I voted, I can vote for whoever I want. And I said, you are correct, you can vote for whoever you want. Uh, but I can vote for who can sit at my Thanksgiving di dinner table and gets pumpkin pie, get the fuck out of my house. <laughs> and, I said, and I said, and she was like, what? And I said, you have to leave. Like, I don't know what else to say. I said to you what I was gonna do, and you cannot do this. You cannot go against, if you love your grandchildren, you need to think hard about your choices. And, and, and you know, everyone at the table was like, Kara, it's a family dinner. I said, I don't care. Like, you've got, at some point, you've got to, like, take a stand. And we reconciled, obviously, since then. And we had a long talk about it. But that was a great, that was a hard moment. It sounds stupid. Sounds, I sound like the most worst person. But she didn't get the friggin' pumpkin pie. And she wasn't getting it. She wasn't getting my pumpkin pie, at least. And she wasn't getting access to my kids when she didn't have a thing. And I know it sounds like too much. And people are like, oh, how could you do that to your mother? I'm like, because I could. Because she couldn't, like, I, I, and I said to her at one point when she was upset about it initially, I'm like, I don't negotiate with terrorists. I'm sorry. You're going to have to change your opinion <laughs> or go see a therapist or do something because you cannot do this. And, and so I'm just saying you just have to, like, you have to speak up. If you don't speak up and, and pay the price for it, because I love my mom. I love spending time with her. Um, if you don't pay the price for things that are important, you're going to, you have to. You just, you just have to pay the price. That's all. Well, it's not about I am so sorry, but we are out of time. Kara Switcher, watch her interview with Tim Cook tonight. Yep. Thank you. Thank you.